He has written more than 30 books, including the one we'll be talking about tonight, The Encyclopedia of Magic and Alchemy. It's her latest book. It's available now. You can get it through her website, visionaryliving.com, as well as amazon.com and any fine book retailer, uh, which I don't know which ones we can mention on the show because I'm not up to date on which ones uh, are advertised most. But you can uh, – I, I know where you can get it if you need to. You can get it at uh, – um, can I even say their name either? Uh-huh. All right, Crystal Expectations. So, uh, <laughs> how are you doing tonight, Rosemary? Sorry to make you hang on during that long introduction. Hey, it's, I'm doing really good, Tim, and it's a pleasure to be with Keith tonight, too. Hi, Rosemary. So nice to talk with you again. Right. It's, uh, it's always nice when you can put people together that are old friends and, and old colleagues, and they haven't really had the chance to work together or talk to each other. And on a Saturday night like this, you never know what can happen. Well, magic is going to happen tonight. I hope so. Now, uh... With all the different various uh, subject matter that you've written about, I mean, dreams, uh, you've written about you know ghosts and hauntings, uh, different aspects of the paranormal, and magic is probably one of the ones that I think, out of a lot of the subjects that you cover, would be the hardest sell, yet it seems to be the one that has the most uh, deeply rooted history. Magic underlies the paranormal. It's very much linked into all of the topics that I've written about. Prayer and healing, intuition, dreams. Uh, There's a magical aspect to the paranormal, uh, the way people experience the paranormal. Magic is about bringing things into being, and it's it's not um, fantasy. It's it's not a Mickey Mouse in a wizard hat. It's a real power. And I thought it was very important to put together a book to talk about real magic, our long history of it, how it works, and give people some ideas about how they can bring the power of magic into their own lives. But it seems, uh, at least in my discussions with people, uh, you know, you, it's hard to shake that that uh, stigma that has come with the term magic uh, just lately, I guess probably in the last century or so, uh, so where, uh, so the common man, magic is really just a form of entertainment, but the prestidigitation that we see in these stage shows are vastly different from what actual true magic is. Actually, there's a teeny bit of real magic and stage magic. There's a, a form of stage magic known as bizarre magic, and uh, that, that's concerning magicians who have experienced something extraordinary in the process of doing stage magic. That Sometimes there's an element that they can't quite explain about how something works. Magic has unfortunately been either trivialized or demonized. It's lumped in with sorcery evil acts, evil people. Uh, It's trivialized as cartoony entertainment. And that's unfortunate because it's a very real force in daily life. And so much of uh, modern day beliefs and philosophy uh, in terms of spirituality are, you know, go hand in hand with these magic beliefs that have been around since uh, pretty much the dawn of man. Uh, Is there a way, is there a such a fine line separating, you know, magic and spirituality in your mind? It's a very fine line. It gets very nebulous. And, in fact, I find that to be the case in the paranormal and, and spiritual and mystical in general. It's very difficult to draw black and white demarcations from one area to another. They all kind of bleed together. Prayer, for example, is a form of magic, and many people would uh, object to that of definition but prayer is an act of using your your thought your will your imagination and working in concert with a higher power to bring about some sort of change in the physical environment those are the fundamentals of magic so praying is a form of magic and i mean let's face it i mean you mentioned it in the book and if you think about it and you think about what these true definitions of magic are, uh, you can look at Jesus as a magician. Well, in fact, many commentaries have been written about Jesus as a magician. Going back to the Old Testament, uh, the acts of uh, Abraham uh, and, and Moses, for example, uh, have an element of magic to them. The, the pharaohs are described as magicians, but the representatives of God are described as something else, that their power is described in different ways, and yet they do the same things. Yet the same book, the Bible, uh, actually comes down against magic. And yet in Christian uh, tradition, if I may, 
They also speak of the Magi coming to present gifts to the baby Jesus, and they were known as Magi. So they were steeped in what was known as magic at the time. They probably were uh, very well educated in the esoteric arts. Magic is uh, it, it's a way of having um, being empowered spiritually, actually, and I think that uh, it doesn't deserve to be demonized at all. But do you do you feel that because uh, there's so much? Uh, I don't know, negativity in the Bible against sorcery, uh, which, you know, we'll talk about in a little while, but uh, do you feel that it's kind of presenting a conflicting nature about uh, about magic? I think we do have conflicted views about, about magic, and a lot of it has to do with our values. If, uh, if the power is used in one way, it's okay. If it's used in another way, it's not okay. Certainly any power that's used for negativity to bring about harm, for example, is... Uh, is wrong and magic is neutral it can be used either for good or for bad but when we get into nuances of uh, if you're doing something in the name of a certain deity or a certain uh, person then it's okay and and if you're the enemy of of that deity then it's not okay this is a subjective distinction and i mean this goes as far back as probably uh, the beginning of man, because there was always some element of, I don't want to say those who are more spiritually in tune or, or connected, but they would always seem to have uh, a higher power to them than the common folk. Uh, so all these shaman, these healers that go back into these ancient tribes are all really just some form of magician, u- utilizing that force in a positive or negative man- manner. I mean, is that the way you would view it? Well, traditionally, magic has been the province of the priest or the shaman, someone who is uh, either born with a certain power or trained to acquire certain power and attunement of consciousness. But actually, it's a power that's available to everyone. I think magic deserves to be democratized. And there's a theory that ancient cave paintings do represent a form of magic. Would you agree with that, Rosemary? I certainly do. I think that Ever since human beings have uh, formed into societies and wondered about uh, their relationship to, uh, to the earth and animals and higher powers, we've been aware of magic. We've been aware of the ability to make things happen if we do something in the right way. The cave paintings seem to indicate that human beings were aware of a relationship to higher power and that if you were properly attuned to those higher powers, whether that was nature or something else that human beings conceived, then certain things would happen uh, to fulfill your goals and, and needs. I think we have a call on the line. If you have a question about magic uh, and you'd like to pose it to Rosemary, or if you have a question for Keith Johnson, you can give us a call, 508-996-0500, 508-291-0500. Let's go to the phones here. Good evening, you're on Spooky South Coast. How you doing? Oh. Hello. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Okay. My name's John. I'm just calling from San Diego, California. Okay. I was try- trying to reach Tim Weinsberg. That is me. Hi. Uh, hello, Tim. How you doing? Um, I remember I talked to you a couple, what, a month ago? Oh, okay, yep. About that website? Yeah, and you spoke with Matt Moniz. I'm sorry, sir? You spoke with Matt Moniz afterward? Yeah, I did. Uh, I haven't heard anything back from you guys, so I thought I'd make some little uh, contact with you guys. I know that and, uh, I know that Matt was uh, in the process of trying to do a little digging on what you were talking about. Yeah, I hope he reached that website because I've been trying to uh, give this information out to all the investigators, and um, I recently talked to Bill Burns. Okay. You know, and uh, many other people. I've just been on radio also, uh, Eddie Nettleton. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt with uh, the oh, discussion no, no, you have tonight. That's fine. Uh, if you want to, um, I don't know, why don't, why don't I have uh, Matt Moniz get back in touch with you and we can try to set aside a time when you can come on and talk about it. That would be great. Okay. That would be fantastic. Uh, do you have my number? Yeah, he does. He, he's got it uh, he uh, saved in his yeah. cell phone, I believe. So. Well, there's some developing news, and i like to talk to him. Hopefully he could give me a call either tomorrow morning or whatever when he can. Okay. I know he's in New York this weekend uh, with Bud <laughs> Hopkins, so. Hopefully. Oh, Bud, yeah, I, I've been trying to reach Bud, too, you know? 
Okay. Let them know what's going on. We'll see. Uh, we'll see if Matt can hook that up for you. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Right, I do thanks. appreciate this. Thank you, John. Have a good night. You too. Bye bye. That is uh, a caller who called in after the show uh, about a month or so ago, and he has a developing situation uh, regarding UFOs that he was talking with Matt Moniz about, and I know that Matt was trying to do a little bit more digging uh, on the subject. So once we get more information, we get more stuff together, we'll present it to the Spooky South Coast audience. So sorry to uh, to interrupt the discussion, Rosemary, but... Actually, we could use a good UFO case these days. <laughs> I, well, we're getting one in Chicago, it seems, uh, with uh, with the sightings over O'Hare Airport. Yeah, those are pretty interesting. And uh, I heard uh, Linda Moulton Howe on a radio show last night talking about some of the new uh, information that has come to light. So if you check out her website, earthfiles.com, you can find out more information there. And we're going we're gonna to have Linda on sometime in the future. So we can uh, get into that case more. And, and, and so, Rosemary, I mean, it's, it's just uh, the way that this show works, because uh, we don't have the live streaming, sometimes people just call in with random questions. So... That's oh, fine. Hopefully it doesn't interrupt uh, the flow of the conversation too much. I'm sure Keith and I can feel just about anything. That's oh, true. Yeah. We, we, between us, I think we can. <laughs> and uh, But getting back into the subject of magic, uh, I said at the top of the show from reading in your book, you know, there's, there's no such thing really as good or bad magic. It's how it's used. Exactly. And over the years, uh, it seems like the good magic that's been done has been given other terms, uh, other ways of making it sound more rosy than calling it magic, whereas the darker side uh, has been referred to as black magic or even witchcraft. Uh, and is that coming down, you think, from the different religion groups uh, and how they're categorizing it to their followers? I think that because magic places power in the hands of an individual, it's in the interests of an institution, such as a religion, to keep that power uh, as limited as possible. Exactly. Other, otherwise, uh, people have no need for the institution. And that's unfortunately, that goes to, at least in my opinion, uh, more than just views on magic. That goes to pretty much top to bottom, everything involved in, in a set of religious beliefs. Exactly. And uh, we've, uh, we've opened that door a few times here where we've uh, called out uh, different or, uh, religious organizations for some of their practices, and it, it opens up a groundswell. So we just want to state that we are not in any way... Uh, putting down any religion we're just saying that as with anything you know uh, anything in power wants to remain in power so that being said uh, let's we'll move away from that a little bit <laughs> now and some of these magic uh, magic philosophies uh, differ greatly from region to region in the in the uh, older times in the more ancient times uh, but there was different forms of magic in places like Egypt and then there was like the greco-roman magic uh, what are some of the major differences between how magic was observed in these early, quote-unquote, superpowers of the world? It has to do with the uh, perceptions of the higher powers, the pantheon of deities, of course, that uh, a culture relates to. One of the things I always appreciated about Roman magic is they were famous cursers. They cursed all the time, uh, and that's a form of magic to place uh, a negative spell on anybody for anything, a business rival, a love rival, somebody who uh, looked at you uh, cross-eyed and made you feel bad. The Romans were famous for this. They would write down curses on, on tablets and, um, and pray very hard for these ill wishes against someone else to come to pass. And it seems like uh, the... The Greco-Roman beliefs uh, in the multiple gods, uh, they don't believe in the, the monotheistic uh, that we observe today, but they would have these multiple gods that would be responsible for different aspects of daily life. And how much uh, intertwined with that was magic with, with these gods? How much of it was associated to these individual gods? Well, for example, if you wanted to do something magical, you would petition the appropriate deity for that. Mm -hmm. um, whoever would be in charge of good luck or fertility or domestic happiness, love, personal power and strength. So a spell uh, or a ritual would be oriented around um, asking for the favors of a particular deity. And by doing that, it kind of, uh, I don't want to say devalues the power, but instead of having one all-powerful being and using magic as a way of kind of uh, making yourself equal to that being uh, and trying to usurp the power of that being. 
by using it with individual deities, it's using it alongside the deity, if you, if you follow what I mean. Uh, instead of uh, too much of the view of magic in a, in a you know, a one-god society is that somebody's trying to equal or rival the power of God. But in that type of format, it was easier to work with the gods, and it wasn't seen so blasphemous. Well, that uh, that's one view that magic um, has the potential to usurp the power of God, that it replaces your relationship with uh, the one power, the one presence. Uh, but in the pantheon of deities, um, they're just aspects of, of Godhead. I consider mm-hmm. them to be all pieces of, of the one anyway. And that, I mean, I'm... I personally wish that there was more uh, observance of that type of, a little bit more credence lent to that type of observance because it was key in forming the religious beliefs that we have today. And uh, too, more often it's, it's relegated to fable and fairy tale in a classroom these days. But that's, that's a shame. But the, in the Egyptian uh, point of view of magic too, I mean, they really took it to the extreme. It was very important in their daily life and in their afterlife as well. Especially the afterlife, the Egyptians placed a great deal of importance on what happens to us after death, how we navigate uh, through the, uh, the underworld to reach safety. There were, were many magical texts and many magical spells devoted to this. A great deal of attention of the living was absorbed, uh, among certain classes at least, in how, how to die properly and, and how to reach the afterlife safely. And also, one of the uh, in your book here it mentions too one of the uh, important aspects of the magician's work in ancient Egypt was exorcisms as well. Exorcisms exist everywhere, and I think uh, every culture has had some ritual or procedure for expelling troublesome uh, entities out of daily life. We have um, a great variety of views about how. Spirit beings can interfere. In many cultures, almost anything that n- negative, uh, almost anything that is negative, can be blamed on an interfering entity. And uh, an exorcism is not quite the the um, serious matter that it is in Christianity. And by that, I mean it's not the all-out battle for the soul. It's just getting rid of a troublesome presence in your life. Uh, but in Christianity, we've um, come to view demons as really after our souls, our uh, our very core essence, and that if we fall victim to them in the most extreme fashion, that's what's at stake. And it seems like uh, a lot of these magical uh, philosophies that were born in those more ancient times continued to carry out uh, into later times uh, in post post Jesus time as well. Uh, I mean, that's when you started to really see the performance of the quote-unquote miracle and where it was magic performed through God, which makes it, you know, uh, divine. And we move into the aspect of Jewish magic, too, as well, uh, going on at the same time, where it was a little bit more mystical and not really as out in the open. Is that is that correct? Well, the, there were certainly mystical traditions devoted to uh, accessing various hierarchies of beings, both angels and uh, demons. In the, uh, in the ancient world, both spirits were in you know, great abundance, and you could, you could have access to either one. In fact, many of the old magical grimoires, the old handbooks, uh, call for rituals to summon uh, what are called demons, to help you effect a spell. And these entities can have helpful qualities and negative qualities. And it seems like uh, as magic, uh, as I don't know if, if it's more the uh, modern man as we've forwarded in our thinking and forwarded in our beliefs, or if it's more the religious oppression of the streamlining of religion as we go along, but magic does fade more into the background as the years go by. At, at what point did it become less part of people's daily lives? Because I think during medieval times, at least what we've learned through popular culture, uh, magic was pretty prominent during that day as well. It was indeed. And, of course, during the Inquisition, there was a great deal of attention focused on 
the lowest forms of magic, that is sorcery, uh, witchcraft that would be used for negative purposes, the interference of uh, demons as part of the battle for the soul, the infestation of demons. After the Renaissance, magic began to um, fade away and become more trivialized. And now it's unfortunately part of our entertainment culture. Mm -hmm. But would you say during those medieval times, I mean, was magic probably, I don't want to say at its peak of acceptance, would you say? I think that magic was very much alive in daily culture. For example, the average person would go see a village um, magician, a wise woman, a sorcerer, a cunning man. They had many names when they wanted uh, blessings, when they wanted their crops to come in good, when they wanted their animals to be healthy, when they wanted to have good health. In fact, in, in some areas, it would be an annual tradition to go and visit the local wizard uh, or the local witch to get some sort of blessing for the year. So uh, people were very much engaged in um, spell casting and um, that sort of magic in the Middle Ages. I mean, it seems like the stuff of fairy tale and fiction, but, you know, these royal courts uh, that existed then when they were the various uh, crown heads of Europe, they did have, you know, magicians as part of their court. They did rely heavily on somebody influencing some sort of force in their life. Now, I've heard that uh, the personage of Merlin the Magician may have represented an actual alchemist or somebody who really lived. Uh, what, do you, what can you tell me about that, Rosemary? I think that Merlin did have some basis in historical fact, but um, it's really buried. Uh, no one really knows exactly who he might have been. I think that over the time, over time, the legends have been combined about a number of people to, you know, make up the one person known as Merlin. It's usually that is. Uh... You know, when you have the composite of something like that and you're building a legend, it's hard to believe that it could be based in fact. But, I mean, if some of the stories are true, I mean, uh, just doing some research online, it talked about certain kings and certain uh, crown heads that would each have this one trusted advisor that supposedly had the power of magic. Uh, and if you're going to put all your faith in somebody, you would want it to be somebody with that type of abilities. Yes, this would be someone who would be attuned to the higher powers, who would have uh, psychic ability, the ability to prophesy, the ability to interpret dreams, to read signs in nature. These are psychic skills, and that's part of magic, too. I don't like to generalize, but it seems like a, a, during the medieval times when uh, the church was still, and I say church meaning the, the Roman Catholic Church, was still in the beginnings of extending its power uh, throughout the world, there was a, a brief period of time where people could look uh, at the world around them and still hold on to some of those pagan beliefs of, you know, worshiping the earth and the things that are happening. Uh, and is that really where, when these magicians draw their power, is that what the allure was? Uh, because there was no pervading religion yet overtaking the world? I, I think that magic offers us a unique way to relate to the natural world, and unfortunately this is one of the things that's gotten submerged into the background mm -hmm. of monotheistic religion. We, we've lost a lot of our uh, attunement to the forces of nature, for example, which are very important in magic overall. Uh, we've sort of put all of our eggs in one basket, so to speak. And I, I apologize for some of the convolutedness of my questions. I'm trying to dance my way around the religion issue as I'm asking them. <laughs> it's uh, Unfortunately, you can't get around it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you know, bound up in the whole question of magic. I, I generally I generally don't when I when I address the subject here on the show because you know no matter what we're talking about in terms of the paranormal, uh, different religion and religious beliefs come up, and generally I try not to dance around them. But for some reason, magic is something that really draws the ire of those who are firmly against it. Well, it does. And, in fact, take, for example, prayer. Uh, the idea that prayer would be called a form of magic is automatically going to make a lot of people very angry. Uh, there's people already writing letters, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, but when you look at the principles of prayer and the way we pray, uh, it's very hard not to call it a form of magic, and, and that doesn't mean that it's 
um, negative or that it detracts from God or our relationship with God. It's a way of relating to the, that power and, and to bring that power through us and into the physical world. What we're going to do is we're going to take our last break of the hour, and then uh, when we come back, I'd like to get a little bit into one of the most uh, uh, one of the most polar figures in the world of magic, and that would be Aleister Crowley. And uh, we can talk a little bit more about him and some of his involvement and part of what what he did and, and what he I don't want to say did to dispel magic because that's kind of a it sounds like a bad pun. But, you know, some of uh, the negative negativity that was attached to his beliefs and how that kind of hurt Magic's reputation over the years. And then uh, we'll take a break for the news. Uh, we'll do the week and weird in the second hour. And then we can talk a bit about modern magic as well, if that, that sounds good to you, Rosemary. Sure does. All right. So we'll be right back in about two minutes here on Spooky South Coast. Do you believe this magic? I love magic. Spooky South Coast is burned. Abracadabra. We're going to reach out and grab you because we are Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, silent assassin Matt Costa whipping up his magic, and Keith Johnson along as our special guest host. And we are talking to Rosemary Ellen Guiley about magic and alchemy. And uh, we'll actually get into alchemy a little bit too as well because we haven't really talked about that particular subject matter. Uh, but one of the figures that I wanted to talk about is probably oh, somebody who is uh, both vilified and glorified in the world of magic, and that would be Alistair Crowley. Uh, Rosemary, what's your opinion of, of Alistair Crowley and uh, his time on this earth? Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. He was quite talented and quite a brilliant magician. He had an oversized ego and an oversized personality way over the top, uh, and a lot of the attention for his outrageous behavior unfortunately tarnished the real magical ability and brilliance that he had. Because unfortunately he used magic as um, an avenue to satisfy some of his desires, uh, which at the time were not really quite accepted. Uh, he, he was a uh, bisexual, and uh, he was... Let's just say, uh, how can we put this on set? He's a little freaky. <laughs> well, he certainly was, and he indulged in a lot of scandalous behavior and practices with uh, prostitutes and experimenting with drugs, with um, self-inflicted physical abuse, verbal abuse of other people. Uh, he made a big discovery about the importance of uh, sex and magic, however, and sex actually is an undercurrent through everything in the paranormal, spiritual, and mystical. It's part of the power. Sexual energy can be used in magic um, to increase the, the power of the magic. All right, now we're getting into the good stuff here. <laughs> and uh, sorry, I always have to go for the lame joke. That's, that's my job. <laughs> but, um, it, it is, but it was one of the, the key points that people bring up when talking about him is it's either used as a way, like you said, to credit what he did by bringing it into magic or to discredit him as he was just some weirdo in using, you know, magic because he knew that those people would be more accepting of that, uh, that lifestyle as well. But he, at the time, he really did revamp magic, not just with the sexual aspect of it as well, but just in a lot of his theories, uh, he viewed it with a completely different point of view than had been previously accepted. The highest form of magic is a spiritual path. It's a path of enlightenment and coming to know yourself and also expanding your consciousness into the higher planes uh, to attune to whatever you call the Godhead. Crowley was very interested in that, and a lot of his magic was oriented to that. And uh, he had one basic law that he followed uh, that he that he essentially put out there, and uh, that was uh, from I don't know if I'm going to say it correctly, but the law of uh, Thelema. Uh, Thelema. Thelema. Which what is, thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that was a, a bit of a different approach to what uh, people in the magic community were used to. Well, it it sounds very selfish to some people. It, it sounds like it's uh, self indulgent, but. Actually, what it means is um, 
that you, you do what you must. In other words, if you follow the path of enlightenment, you are constantly called to the highest path. So you do what you must according to that calling. Because I, when I was reading over uh, the material in the encyclopedia, uh, and I read about that, I said, "Well, gee, you know, that seems like somebody who is using magic for the to, for their own self serving purposes." But when you realize what he was talking about and what he did to apply that to his life, then you realize it is a more enlightened way of thinking. Yes, it is, and it was very revolutionary for the time too. But unfortunately, uh, his life took a, a, a downturn rather quickly. Uh, he was involved with uh, some magical organizations, uh, of course. You know, the, why don't you talk a little bit about his involvement with the biggest magical organization? The OTO? Yes. Well, the, uh, the OTO, uh, oh, one of his most interesting relationships was with Jack Parsons. And um, Jack Parsons was a very interesting character, a rocket scientist who... Uh, died in in a laboratory explosion in his garage. Um, the thought is that he may have been experimenting with some of uh, Crowley's magic to uh, actually make a um, a female entity in the flesh. Now that's uh, that's definitely bringing sex into magic. I think a little bit. And uh, and Crowley himself. Uh, died under some terrible circumstances as well. I mean, he basically just spiraled down uh, through drug use. Is that is that accurate, or is that just the way it's been portrayed? Uh, it is. He was pretty dissipated and by the time he died. He was very weak. Uh, his powers had left him a, kind of a sad figure at the end. But, but it was more than just uh, what he accomplished uh, in the world of magic as well. He was a, a very well-respected and renowned author as well. Well, his magical works are still in print today, and actually they're kind of hard going, some of them. Um, you kind of have to wade through a lot of um, convoluted language, but the essence of them is still very important. And, of course, the uh, tower deck he designed is still very much in use today. Is that correct? It is, Keith, and people either love it or they don't like it at all. It just polarizes people. There's a very strange energy to it. Um, I'm very familiar with the tarot because I've used the tarot for many years, and, and I've done three um, works on the tarot myself. It's For many people, it's a very uncomfortable deck, but the images in it are very evocative. They activate consciousness in a very profound way. And unfortunately, uh, in modern times, uh, Aleister Crowley's been lumped in with a lot of Satanists. Uh, you hear about him being along the same lines of, you know, the Church of Satan and uh, and some of those figures. But he wasn't a Satanist. He was just, you know, in he, magic was his religion. And he was not a Satanist, even though uh, he's, you know, known as the Great Beast. But he truly thought that he was going to usher in a new religion, a new eon. That's what his magic was oriented toward, and it never really caught hold as such. Well, I think uh, Anton Zander LeVay modeled his persona, his outward persona, after Crowley to a certain extent with the shaven head and everything which he did in uh, April of 1966 and, uh, you know, really fed into that uh, satanic appearance like that. But th there is a uh, claim by Crowley that he was visited by some kind of demonic being that resembled a small gray. Isn't that true that uh, he was visited by this being that uh, really seemed to be the typical alien type of creature? I think that he was in contact with entities that we would call aliens. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, whether or not he actually considered them to be an alien in an extraterrestrial sense, uh, I'm not certain that he did because it's, it's not clear in, in his works, but uh, the, the kind of entities that he was in contact with would certainly fit into those categories. Mm -hmm. There's also a rumor that Crowley had an affair with H.P. Lovecraft's wife, but uh, that's simply because Sonia Half Green, years before she was married to Howard Lovecraft, attended a writers' conference in New York where Aleister Crowley was one of the key speakers. And there's no evidence that they even met, let alone had a love affair. So that's that's where that rumor came from. 
Well, he certainly had love affairs with just about everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was quite a character. And and how much did Magic uh, benefit or suffer after his passing? I know you said that his views never really caught hold, but what was his, uh, not so much his passing because he was kind of out of the, the major loop before that, but what kind of uh, impact did he leave on Magic uh, in, in his wake? I think he's continued to have a major impact on how people how people who practice magic view magic. Um, as as I mentioned, he, his new eon never really caught on with the general public, but in the magical community, his uh, influence is still felt today. Uh, and I think that um, he deserves serious study and some uh, to be looked at in a more serious light. Well, one lasting impact that he's had uh, is in the world of rock and roll, uh, from Jimmy Page to Ozzy Osbourne, uh, some of these uh, heavy metal artists of the late 70s, uh, early 80s, uh, during that time when, when English heavy metal was uh, predominant in music. Uh, he had a profound impact. I mean, Aleister Crowley is considered... I don't know the the father of a lot of what Led Zeppelin was doing because Jimmy Page said he was channeling him living in his uh, in his house in London. Uh, so, what we're going to do is actually we're going to play out uh, into the news the Ozzy Osbourne song "Mr. Crowley" because we figured they never really get to play enough Ozzy on WBSM, being a talk radio station. So we're going to play that for you as we head into the CBS News. On the other side, we will have the Week and Weird. We will talk a little bit about a new cable access program coming to New Bedford uh, that follows right along the subject matter of what we're talking about uh, here on Spooky South Coast each week. And then on the other side, uh, like I said, we'll have the Week and Weird. I have a story here from the New York Times, Rosemary, about magic that ran this week. I don't know if you saw this, but it seems like every time you're with us, the New York Times runs a story uh, related to what we'll be talking about. It happened last time with dreams, so we'll synchronicity. <laughs> exactly. That's a very interesting synchronicity. We'll uh, we'll talk about that, and then uh, we'll also talk more about modern magic, uh, as well as the art of alchemy. And we'll check in with Matt Moniz a little bit later on. But uh, for right now, we will play you out to the tunes of Mr. Crowley by Ozzy Osbourne, and then we'll see you back here in a few minutes here on Spooky South Coast. We're talking about magic and alchemy with our guest Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Rosemary, sorry, sorry to keep you waiting for so long. There, we had some. Uh, important FCC fines to draw for ourselves there. That was all very interesting, and especially <laughs> that article from the New York Times on magic. It, it, re- it really is strange how uh, they always seem to sync up with your appearances here, but it, it was talking about the modern view of magic and not discrediting it, but saying, you know, not really giving it much credence either, saying that it's an impulse in the brain to uh, use a magical explanation for things that we don't understand. I mean, you have to agree with that to some degree. Uh, a little bit. I think that there's a tendency among skeptics and some scientists to say that, well, because we have certain mechanisms in the brain, certain processes in the brain, uh, that dismisses everything supernatural. I think my view is that we have the hard wiring that enables us to perceive these things. We have the the chemical uh, pathways in the brain built in so that we can... Um, make use of, of these abilities. So that's my view on it. Um, I think the other view is kind of a reductionist view that uh, unfortunately keeps us from um, paying attention. But there is, there is throughout history, there always has been a tendency to use uh, the magical and the mystical as an explanation for things that we don't understand. But And a lot of times it, it's, not, it's not a cop-out, it's not an excuse, it really is the reason. I, I think so. I think uh, that's the reason, or, or one of the reasons, why human beings have always had these thoughts, these inclinations, and these beliefs throughout history. The frameworks may change, the definitions, the specifics, but fundamentally, it's the same orientation. And now we talked a little bit at the beginning of the show about how magic is viewed today, and how uh, unfortunately it's it's been relegated to a form of entertainment. Uh, and unfortunately, more so, uh, it's been sent down into the comedy realm as the years, as as really good stage magicians have uh, evaporated a bit, and as the some of the trickery involved has been exposed, magic has kind of fallen out of the limelight, and it's kind of just you know the sideshow act now, uh, and that's a shame. I mean, guys like the amazing Jonathan, who is a, a wonderful comedian and magician, but 
it's viewed as a joke now. It's not viewed as a serious art. Well, here are some of the ways that we practice magic on a daily basis. And I did mention prayer earlier, that mm-hmm. prayer is a, a ritual of attunement for uh, achieving something in the physical world or uh, improving one's spiritual enlightenment as well. But um, if you set intentions... For the day, you're practicing a very simple form of magic. That is, you're organizing your thoughts, your will, your concentration, your mental forces to accomplish something, to bring something into being. If you say affirmations or you write affirmations, you're practicing a very simple form of magic. Uh, if you work on developing your psychic ability, that's part of your magical power because that's an attunement to uh, the unseen realms, the higher powers. People do these things every day. Uh, if we send people good thoughts, that's uh, a very simple form of magic. If we think poorly of somebody, that's technically ill-wishing, which is a form of magic. And unfortunately, a lot of people pray in a negative way, and that's negative magic. It's just it's things like this that you wouldn't really put into the you wouldn't think that would be considered magic, but it does tune into that that other realm. We just haven't put magic in our daily vocabulary. Mm-hmm. And, and and fortunately, as we said before, there is that negative connotation with a lot of it these days. Uh, how is it being observed uh, as much as it was before? Are there still these uh, magical sects, these magical orders that still? look at it as part of their daily life as as almost a religion? There are a lot of magical organizations today uh, that practice different paths of magic. As I mentioned earlier, magic, uh, one of the highest forms of magic is a spiritual path, Mm -hmm. and it's a a pursuit of enlightenment, of um, self-purification, of attaining... um, a higher state of consciousness that attunes to the divine, which could have many different labels and names. So um, you can practice it by yourself. There are many manuals out there, for example, for solitary magic. And then there are magical orders. And, and magic has uh, become, as it becomes uh, involved in your da- in your daily life, as you said, on a way that you don't even realize it, it allows it to um, insert itself without that stereotype. I think that's very important. You know, that New York Times article touched briefly on group power of um, magic. That is, uh, for example, when a lot of people watch the Super Bowl, uh, they feel that they've had an impact in which side wins. Well, group consciousness does have a power, and that's been recognized in mystical traditions since ancient times. Uh, There's been even scientific research on that, that uh, when you have a large group of people uh, holding a certain intention, which is a a very simple form of magic, you can move power in in a very significant way. So I think that um, a lot of times there is real magic involved in a sporting event, for example, which side wins. It, some of that may have to do not just with the skill of the players, but with the group consciousness formed of the people who are participating uh, well, that's by the, watching. That's the only way the Colts could have beaten the Patriots, so just through <laughs> magic. That's the only way they made it. Sorry, sometimes my other job creeps into this one sometimes. So. <laughs> Little voodoo, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, but even so, like magic, uh, you know, in your, in your book, uh, the Encyclopedia of Magic and Alchemy, you talk a bit about modern magic, and you mention, uh, especially in quantum physics, there's the presence of magic, which is really uh, on the forefront of the scientific community now. Well, I think that we're finding science, religion, and the esoteric coming together in more significant ways, and. and at some point, we're going to have a common language that unifies all of these things. Instead of trying to approach them from different perspectives, what we run into there is um, by having one perspective, it sort of negates the others. And I think we need a unified language. And, of course, we experience that talking about the paranormal all the time. It's, it can either be an either-or, uh, and too much of it all blends together. And when there isn't an explanation, sometimes that is the explanation. 
I mean, not to sound uh, a little mystical myself here, but there is, when something doesn't fit that certain theory of what you're working in, it's easier to just discredit than it is to blend in these other ideas. That's right. And we're also beginning to understand that, that everything is interconnected uh, and that we can have an impact on something through our thought as well, uh, that uh, we're not independent of other things that happen in uh, uh, existence. Our thoughts have an impact, and how we think has an impact on everything. And do you also feel that in today's world climate, uh, in the geopolitical way that things are, are shaking out, do you feel that there's an increase in the quote-unquote black magic of magic being used in a negative manner? Is this something that's kind of flying below the radar of a terrorist-dominated world? I certainly think that there are a lot of negative forces at play today. There's a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. My personal feeling is that this has been on the rise for some time and that we had a major shift at 9-11, that the impact of that single terrorist act, even though we've had terrorism uh, and some pretty horrific terrorism prior to that, there was something about the way the world focused on that, uh, the reverberations of that that went around the planet, the shock waves, I think really ripped something in our dimension that enabled a lot of chaotic forces to enter into our world, anchor in, and begin to uh, have an impact. And, uh, Keith, I sure would love to hear your thoughts on this, too, because I think that we had um, a very dramatic turn for the worse with the ability of negativity to impact us. I, I definitely agree. I definitely agree that... Uh that the basic attitude of will we be here tomorrow, is everything going to be the same tomorrow, are we safe in our beds at night, it, it kind of brings me back to uh, when I was a small youngster and we were always afraid that there was going to be this uh, nuclear holocaust and we did the duck and cover exercise under our desks and everything like that. We had the fallout shelters and... Uh, just a general feeling of unrest, and I think we've kind of gone back to that where we're not just, we're not quite sure about our daily existence as we were. We're not taking things for granted, and there is a, a general feeling of unrest, and, and that's why people are searching for something concrete. And I also think that we feel more vulnerable, too. Oh, yes, And definitely. when we're vulnerable, we're um, more open to the influences of negative forces. But I do think negative en an increase in negative entities were able to anchor into our physical world and have a better ability to wreak havoc mm -hmm. by influencing people toward negative and evil acts. Well, I, I wonder how much of these negative uh, forces are being used uh, by these terrorists and by these uh, evildoers, as President Bush likes to call them, because here you have you know, some of the world's most renowned and most practiced and trusted remote viewers uh, trying to locate Osama bin Laden or, or various uh, terrorists that the U.S. is in search of. And you have these massive you know, attempts at remote viewing and locating these people. And where it would work for so, in so many other areas, they're unable to find a guy like Osama bin Laden. You wonder if they're using some sort of magical force to help block that and deflect that. It's my personal opinion that uh, I think people do use magical forces for their their own ends and there's probably more of this going on below the radar than we might like to think and uh it seems like as the world you know goes through its its various cycles uh and magic is something that's going to go along with it you know when when people are in a more spiritual place uh, as a whole, it's going to be more accepted and more believed and eventually will become a little bit more colder and skeptical and not willing to accept it. And unfortunately, that's just the way it goes. It's, it's very cyclical, just like uh, most of the things we talk about here. That's right. And we've certainly seen that play out over and over again in history. Well, hopefully uh, we've shed some light on the subject of magic and and uh, made people more aware that it is around us all the time. And, Rosemary, we'd like to thank you uh, for joining us. We're going to check in with Matt down in New York. But before we do that, is there anything coming up on your calendar uh, at visionaryliving.com that you'd like to share with our listeners? 
Yes, I'll be at the Stanley Hotel at the end of March on a haunted weekend. I'll be talking about shadow people. I've been collecting shadow people research for a couple of years now, and uh, I'm uh, putting together my data. I'll be publishing some of that this year. I'm quite excited about it. Uh, some very interesting stories about shadow people and uh, some that literally will make your hair stand on end. And uh, that's Dave uh, Dave Schrader's trip for Darkness Radio, right? That's it, right. And uh, is he still, does he still have some spots open for that? Uh, I know I, it was filling he's, up fast. He's very, if he's not sold out, he's very close to sold out. But he'll be doing some other events later on this year. And I have a number of appearances on my, you can go on my calendar page, visionaryliving.com, where I'll be speaking at conferences and events. Uh, my two main topics this year are shadow people and also sex and the paranormal. Well, that's uh, that's one of my favorite subjects, but not not usually together. But <laughs> it's two things that are constantly on my mind. Uh, now, with all this uh, research and, and discussion into shadow people, could we be seeing the Encyclopedia of Shadow People coming up? Well, I don't have enough for an encyclopedia. I was, was going to say, I'm wondering <laughs> if there's enough information out there to put, put one I together. I certainly have enough for a book. And the world is, needs a book on shadow people because there's so many alternative competing theories that if you can use your uh, ability to rope everything together and, and present it in your style, I think it will help increase the visibility. Oh, by the way, Rosemary, I have a message. The Godfather says he's going to make you an offer you can't refuse. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I know who that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny Z. I was visiting with him today, and uh, he said to say hello to you. Well, I'm uh, very pleased to work with John. He asked me to be his Maryland representative recently, and I'm quite excited about that. I, I said, what does this mean? I get demon calls in the middle of the night. Uh, Comes so, to the territory. <laughs> so far, I haven't had any uh, demon calls in the middle of the night, but John is a wonderful guy. I uh, love his work, have a high uh, respect for him, so it's very exciting to actually uh, do some things with him. All right, well, we will all stay tuned to VisionaryLiving.com to keep up to date with everything that's going on and pick up the Encyclopedia of Magic and Alchemy available in bookstores now and on Amazon.com, Amazon.com, Amazon. We're not going to get those seats, so we probably shouldn't overplay it. <laughs> all right, Rosemary, we thank you for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you in the very near future. Thanks, Tim, and good night, Keith. Good night, Rosemary. Good night. Have a good one. And uh, we will have her back. We'll have to talk about shadow people because it oh, yeah. is just an outstanding phenomenon. We we touched a bit upon it with Heidi Hollis last year. Very controversial episode of Spooky South Coast. Oh, but yeah. uh, the subject matter is certainly open for more discussion. And uh, speaking of more discussion, we're going to have that when we come back from a commercial break. We'll check in with Matt Moniz down in New York. He's hanging out with Bud Hopkins and the Intruders Foundation uh, for a special event they had down there tonight. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on Spooky South Coast. Uh, Keith Johnson's show that he produces down in Rhode Island and airs on the Cox systems down there as well as on his website nearparanormal.com and pretty soon they'll have your appearance on there Matt Moniz you are the I guess you're the uh, the TV face of Spooky South Coast because uh, you're the one that looks the actually least normal you there yeah I'm here okay I thought maybe you got mad and hung up on me no I'm still here yeah hanging out with Peter Robbins hey oh, buddy tell him we say hello Tim says hello, Pete. <laughs> and uh, so hello. it's probably uh, quite a, a contingent of uh, UFO researchers and, and uh, authors down there at Bud's uh, event. Uh, was it yeah. a big crowd? I know you're expecting a lot of people. Was it a big crowd? Yeah, actually, it was actually a fairly sizable crowd. Uh, Anna Jameson gave uh, an excellent, excellent lecture about her particular case. Uh, both her and um, Beth uh, Collins were abductees that had been brought together numerous times and then became friends later on afterwards uh, in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, they recognized each other and stuff like that and uh, have been working, and they actually lived together and worked a uh, horse farm out in Virginia. Um, <clears throat> it was an excellent lecture. Loads of people, lots of excellent, relevant questions. Uh, Bud always does well putting on these events. And was the uh, the general population uh, of the of the crowd was it believers? Uh, were there some skeptics in the crowd that were questioning what they were presenting? Uh, it was a, a fair balance of mm -hmm. uh, both skeptics, believer, and people that are just never really knew anything about the subject and were introduced to it for first time. That found it very, very enlightening, to say the least. Now, 
Now, just uh, briefly, if you could just go over exactly what happened to Anna Jamerson and Beth Collins and their experiences. Uh, they were abducted as children, introduced to each other, uh, regularly abducted throughout their lifetimes up into adulthood, uh, met in... Uh, 1987, for the first time outside of a UFO experience, and uh, became very fast friends uh, and started working together and things of that nature. And now they run a, uh, a horse farm and uh, produce a productive business. But but you said earlier that they had been that they had met before, uh, and they met the first time not in abduction. So they had been introduced uh, during the course of their abductions. Right. While they were in the uh, while they were. While they were abducted, they had been introduced by the entities to each other and had no recollection right. of that. Uh, that's the only time that they had met prior to 1987 was with uh, alien through alien abduction. They met in what we would call stark reality here mm -hmm. in 1987, but they had experiences with each other that predated that for many, many years. And when they there met. Sorry, there are a number of cases like that. That's one of the things that I was involved with Bud with for a number of years is cases like this. And there was no uh, recollection when they met in 1987 that they had met previously? Oh, well, I wouldn't say that. There was some recollection, but they couldn't figure out what it was. So kind of like and, one of those I-know-your-face type of situations? Right, 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 right. And, and you say this is something that actually happens, uh, is rather common in abduction cases? They're starting to find out that it is far more common than they originally thought, yes. And, I mean, just, I mean, we're totally speculating here, but for what reason would the would these beings have to introduce people while they're being abducted? Uh, whatever the traits are that would help augment each other to produce a purpose, what that purpose is. To judge their so interaction. To, and... Yeah, the, we'll still yet to determine. There are other cases where it's, two females that help each other. In some cases it's two males. Sometimes it's a male and female. That in some cases they wind up even getting married. Now, yeah, I was going to say, now, obviously uh, Anna and Beth have had a successful relationship uh, in their time since meeting here in what you called stark reality, but is there also in a lot of these incidents uh, these people meet later on here on Earth and work together and succeed together? Yes. So obviously these beings are on to something when they... Are pairing these when, they, when they pair up these people, either for mating or for a production of whatever they're looking to do, whatever their agenda is. And, and that's what is still trying to be determined. That's extremely interesting. It's something I hadn't really heard. Holy deja vu, huh? Oh, well, like I said, I've been working with this type of uh, phenomena for over 15 years now with Bud. So. And uh, when this does happen uh, and when these people are reintroduced and, and reacquired, how often... How does it come about that they have these recollections that they had met before while under abduction? Is it uh, through the, hypnosis? A lot of times or? just like I know you, I know you, and trying to figure out what, why, how, where, and, you know, that type of thing. But Matt, sometimes it's known by people. Sometimes it takes uh, hypnosis. But the, do these people have repressed memories that, that actually prove to be factual later on when they're revealed, even though they've never met this person in, um, in reality before? Yes, Keith, that is true. Oh, that's good. By the way, yes, I'm, keeping you, I'm keeping your seat warm tonight. <laughs> that's all right. You're, you're welcome to take my seat anytime I'm out in the field, Keith. Yeah, yeah. He brings a bit of class to the show that we're usually lacking. <laughs> and yeah, well, well, especially when I'm there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your show has started to air on Ghost or Near when you were the guest, and uh, it looks and sounds great. You were a fantastic guest, I must say. We really appreciated you coming on our show and uh, enlightening us. Oh, not a problem. I, I thoroughly enjoy being on your show, Keith. And we're looking forward to being uh, uploaded on our website so everybody all over the world can see it. All right, cool. And, and it must be nice to be on a show where you're actually welcomed instead of attacked. <laughs> <laughs> on a cable access one, yeah. Yes, instead of the first words out of the mouth, what is a scientist doing investigating the paranormal? So My job. Exactly. And that, that was my exact response, if I recall. That was. It was your exact response. Now, uh, one question I do have is uh, getting back to the idea of these, of these um, I, I don't want to say pre-earthly meetings uh, while under abduction. Is there ever instances in your research where somebody has a memory of being abducted and meeting somebody while being abducted and then tries to search that person out afterward? Yes. Okay. So it does run the gamut of, you know. Well, that's one of the common factors with these same cases that I'm talking about. You know, it's like I know I, this 
I know this person. I wish I really could meet this person. I mean, you don't know where and where, how to search for them or whatever. It's just that in some cases, they wind up eventually meeting. There's definitely, definitely a whole lot going on there. And so it seems like that whatever, so maybe these, if you want to use these as a way to try to determine what these beings are doing, maybe it isn't a negative reason why people are being abducted. Maybe it is something positive and they are trying cases, to, yeah. they are trying to affect uh, change for the, for the good. In some cases, yes. I guess they could put eHarmony out of business eventually, huh? <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Well, uh, I think they probably have more successful matches than eHarmony. And well, it doesn't cost nine ninety five a month. Some so. of these, well, like one in particular that I know, they a uh, couple got a chance to meet each other, got married, and then wound up getting divorced. But I think the divorce wound up having more to do with what was happening with other humans interfering with their relationship, not so much mm -hmm. uh, the ETs. Now, have either Anna or Beth uh, been abducted since they met in 1987? Yes. Okay. So Their last abduction happened in uh, December of nineteen. I mean, sorry, happened in December two thousand and five. So it's still rather frequent. Well, not as frequent as it was. Now, but yes, still occurs. But they have come to realize that they're being abducted. Uh, you know, while they were still being abducted. Yes. Uh, now, the, now, what's interesting with these cases? Now, these cases are called Mickey and Baby Ann cases, uh, and that has to do with a particular case that started the whole thing of this particular type. But uh, with the interesting thing with these cases is, number one, that they're becoming more frequent. Number two, that they're becoming more known by the individuals, the Mickeys and the Baby Hands, and they remember each other more often. And, and so my question is, when they do have these realizations that they're being abducted now, what happens if... Beth or Anna are abducted, are they more questioning to what's going on? Are they more accepting to what's going on? Generally more accepting. And can they ask questions of these beings? Or, or Well, you, as best as you can ask them questions, whether they answer you or whether they give you a truthful answer, maybe what's to be determined. But most of the time they they give you you don't need to know or or give you an answer that doesn't mean anything. Because, unfortunately, I mean, I guess I'm operating a bit in the dark here, but I've thought that as people realize they're being abducted, then their increase, it decreases their chances of being abducted because that's why the people that are out no. there saying, take me, take me, never get taken. Not necessarily. Most abductees, genuine, genuine abductees, are the type of people that would not wish this type of thing on their worst enemy. Now, Matt, okay. uh, is, are these abductions taking place on a physical level or a metaphysical level? Oh, very physical. In most cases, very physical. Now, that was the other thing I was going to mention about the Mickey and Baby Ann cases. Especially once these two individuals meet, dollars to donuts, and more times when they're abducted after they meet and they're living together or they're together, it's witnessed. Their abductions are witnessed by outside observers. Both of these people being taken. Are they ever recorded? Yes. On video or, or something? Uh, like the, on these of uh, these particular types, I believe there's one or two uh, supposed recordings, but there's hundreds of uh, eyewitnesses of of these events happening. Yeah, of Mickey and Baby Ann's. Uh, in other words, people that have been brought together by them and being taken together and have been witnessed by other people. Right. Hence the, the term in Bud Hopkins' book, Witnessed. All right, well, thank you for checking in with us down in New York and tell everybody we said hello. We're just about out of time. Uh, but before uh, we wrap up the show, I want to say happy anniversary to you, Matt, since tomorrow, actually in three minutes, will be our one-year anniversary here at Spooky South Coast. Cool. So, well, like I said, I'm hanging out here with Bud Hopkins. Um, he says hello, by the way. Liz is uh, young lady friend. Leslie Kane says hello. Dave Jacobs who's also here, says hello. And, of course, Peter says hello, and he wants to come back on as soon as he can when he can get the rest of his stuff. Any one of them is welcome back anytime. Uh, maybe someday we'll even get them all on at one time. And uh, we, we thank you for going down and reporting to us. And Keith yeah, Johnson, problem. we thank and you. And I'd like to thank Keith for uh, sitting in for me. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure on this anniversary show. 
and uh, we'll definitely have Keith back in the future. All our listeners know that he's an integral part of what we do here. Uh, make sure you check out his website, nearparanormal.com, and you can check out all his shows there and keep up to date with his classes. February 16th here in New Bedford and February 3rd, uh, 2nd Second. in Providence. And uh, keep up to date with all the information there. Uh, next week, we'll be back with Dr. Lewis Turry talking 2007 predictions. We'll talk to you then. Stay protected.